Hello, conference report. I couldn't make a video right away, but I've been thinking about it. Uh, thanks for explaining what Big Dog meant. That is a very interesting robot. And this is exactly what I was explaining in the video you replied to. It doesn't seem living to me. I don't give much credence to the idea that as we talk about the criteria of living, that it's really very difficult. As you, uh, as, as Dyna, Dinah's cat loves me, is, is want to point out, you know, there's a lot of easy cases. And we ought to have a principle for those easy cases. And those principles are going to be based on behavior. There's nothing else to go on. And the behavior, not just of the system as a whole, but also of the parts when you look really close at how it operates. And uh, Big Dog doesn't make that. There's a lot of things left besides walking. There's energy consumption and reproduction, all sorts of things before it really starts to look like something that any of the attempts at classifying li 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 matter as living um, have been. You know, there are um, the ability to reproduce, the sustenance, all of the above. So, um, that's what my point in that video was, is that uh, this is our basic thing. I think that we have the same mechanisms, we're the same kind of machinery, so that's a major difference. And I think that I'm right in that. I think it's obvious. I think we all kind of agree. Now, in terms of the other thing is, you said that the terms are not uh, that useful. Well, I've worked on that. That's uh, you might have seen another video of mine about language. So I made a presentation applying those ideas about language to this term. Now, I haven't done a lot of this analysis on the term consciousness. I've done a tremendous amount on epistemological terms like knowledge, which consciousness depends on according to my analysis. But this should give you an idea and uh, a way that I think we can sort out language not to get all the answers because all the answers aren't in language but we sort out language so we can discuss our answers that are the answers that are in us all right on consciousness language 7.0 analysis well first of all um, principles of language evolution you know just like there's rules of grammar there's rules of how you can change the language, acceptable ways, reasons that are considered legitimate, just like phrases that are considered legitimate. And some phrases that might, you know, make common sense grammatically, they're not acceptable. And sometimes it's for bullshit bogus reasons, and sometimes it's for good reasons of clarity. So when we're evolving the language, we're changing things like that, like grammar and terms, each term having its own grammar to a certain degree. We invent new bits of language and it's for a reason specifically it's to, to address issues like I just raised so I have a few of these principles in my L7 uh, project okay so L7 is going to be what I call language 7.0 so I don't have to say language 7.0 so many times alright the intent of the new definition that's important okay so for example take a, a concept called high redefinition uh, a classic example is the number of doctors in New York. You say, there's no doctors in New York. It's kind of like the real Scotsman thing. There's no real doctors in New York. There's no doctors in New York. That can be made true if you're allowed to define doctor as you see fit. I define doctor as someone who, no matter what malady has been brought to them, always cured the patient. Okay. On the other hand, well, that's an illegitimate example because of the intent excluding 100% of this group. What about when you first uh, introduce medical accreditation? You know, before that, by like, some common sense of asking, are you a doctor? You had, you know, 20,000. And then you invent this accreditation and somebody else can come along with authority and say, hey, no, you have 10,000 doctors and another 10,000 people claim they're doctors but they're not accredited and so on and so forth. You increase your ability uh, to, well, I'll go on to these next motivations. But anyway, so the, the intent, if it is to, to improve the language, 
good if it's just to I don't know control doctors through controlling the language then that would be wrong there might be a balance there but the balance is found in studying the intent all right the coherence of the new definition is, is important so for that just take uh, Ayn Rand's definition of objectivism doesn't matter what her intent was it's inherent it's self-contradictory so that matters if, if your new proposed change is, is even coherent and of course if it's incoherent it speaks to well, why would you want to do that and you know it's for some bad intention all right the concreteness and resolution in the new definition so for this imagine an original idea of a foot now even if it's standardized now if it's just a person's foot well everybody's foot is different but even if it's standardized as the king's foot well the kings change and even if, if the king doesn't change, people don't really get a lot of access to the king's foot and different concepts of what the distance is can develop. So when you in, reinvent the term foot to me, know it's a specific thing here. And you define it, for example, as we do now in terms like we do with a meter, you know, physical concepts that can be measured. And, and, and so we can have this super consistent idea of a foot that is an argument for the new definition if it's more if it increases the resolution because the the newer modern idea of the foot as a distance compared to the old well it's the king's you know length of the king's foot uh, you know and whether that's um, whether that's an old wives tale that origin doesn't matter it's just it's just it's an example okay so we have a more concrete term with better resolution that argues in favor that that the language can evolve in the direction of that definition and then finally in terms of this particular list uh, you know it matters what the systematic relations of the new definition are to related terms it might be uh, that you have to define a whole new set of terms fine then it's the relationship between you know the new terms um, ideally you invent a term that has at least a decent relationship with classical terms All right, L7 term analysis, we're going to do a few things to look at the word consciousness. Uh, one, we're going to say, uh, get an assessment of the structure of the various senses of the term. We're going to do these quick. I mean, these things take, take a long time, right? Um, so we'll get a rough uh, idea of the structure of different senses of the term. We know terms have multiple senses. Um, neutralize the values in the term, because I believe strongly the L7 principle is here got to take the value judgments out of the terms and let them be in the sentences so for example neutralizing the value in a term you know take the term superficial as a negative connotation well after you neutralize the value it just means having to do with the surface right all right uh, extensional analysis is a way of looking at um, what at the set of things that we've recognized because this is not recognized by definitions that you find in a dictionary, the so-called intentional definitions. It's recognized by our uh, built-in, genetically programmed, partially and conditioned uh, neurological pattern recognition machine. So we always have these sets before of, of things that we think should be labeled with the same label, uh, category-wise, or whatever you want to call it. And... Um, it, it, our problem with inventing definitions and concepts is really just one of can always be broken down into sorting those sets out and that's what extensional analysis tries to do all right so the senses of the term consciousness um, well you know there's various senses um, it comes from the word conscience uh, conscience and uh, there's a concept of, of conscientiousness that's related uh, in the language uh, and then, of course, uh, we have consciousness itself and, and being conscious. Now, if you organize those, you see those are clustering into two uh, kinds of categories. Um, uh, in a way, they mean very similar things, conscience and, and conscious, though conscious is, a, is an adjective. So, you know, the conscious thing and con the, the thing that is a conscious moment is, is what um, I think is a good comparison to, to conscience. It just happens that historically uh, conscience 
uh, though it meant with knowledge in the Latin era, as it went through Latin, it's originally a Greek root, um, there was this, uh, this idea added to it that it was about moral knowledge, right and wrong, so your conscience tells you right and wrong, whereas conscious, or conscious moment, and consciousness has to do with the subjective hard problem. So that's the one we're talking about. So we already have, out of these two classes, probably, uh, to me, it's best to w remember that we're focusing on you know, the conscious moment, not this related term of conscience, though it is related and it's very interesting, but it would have its own kind of analysis, for one thing, because we want to neutralize the values. Well, you know, moral systems are about values, so that gets touchy. When, which, where are you going to neutralize the values? When you're talking a moral system, you neutralize the values of your, uh, maybe of your moral philosophy, the vocabulary of your moral philosophy, but it's still going to be about values that have to be reintroduced. So uh, the moral category is not likely to, to be very fruitful for us in looking for terms that are already neutral. Because we're trying to uh, organize what we already understand about things. So we're going to end up discovering uh, th of the various senses which ones are already more value neutral. You know, which uses of superficial were already more uh, value neutral. And then we will uh, adopt those as technical uh, definitions and uh, basically push the value judgments up into sentences and paragraphs and so on. Um, also, moral knowledge still depends on knowledge, so it makes sense to go ahead and focus on knowledge uh, as a higher resolve thing. The um, concept of moral knowledge is going to depend on what knowledge means. Um, another thing to, to accomplish a value neutralization with consciousness we're going to have to uh, deal with our natural positive affection for life. Now, I know some of us out there finding this easy, and they, they have a negative connotation of, of consciousness. They, they know that consciousness can be painful, right? And this is the balance that we, we need to remember, because there is an idea. We want it to be neither positive nor negative to say that something is conscious. If a rock is conscious, it's not like we had bestowed it with the, the magical loveliness thing. It has to be technical and, um, you know, if it had consciousness, maybe that's terrible because it has no limbs, so it's deaf, mute, you know, it'd be terrible for a rock to have to be conscious given the kind of experience it lives. So we have to neutralize the value of just saying that something is conscious and to come up with a technical definition because values would be expressed in sentences and in books. So um, that will allow us to get tests that have, you know, or concepts that have material tests um, to, to help know if, if they, how well they apply. All right, the extensional analysis. Well, this is a step where we ask, you know, what are examples of things we call, you know, whatever the term is in question. And you know, because of the previous steps to this, I'm willing to use conscious moments. That's what I think we've focused in on. That's the a noun. Um, it's still all about conscious uh, consciousness, and just like conscience is a noun, and conscience is sort of the thing that makes you. Uh, be conscientious and uh, a conscious uh, moment is the thing that makes you uh, be uh, have consciousness okay well again this is a huge cluster to do this with character graphics would be great you should have thousands of words all streaming around well I'm gonna jump to the quick uh, when you look at things that are called conscious moments you come into two major categories that are distinct, the subjective moments of awareness that you personally have, the hard problem of consciousness, and then behavioral consciousness where you think something else looks conscious. And it's worth noting that when you think that, when you observe behavior, you are conscious of a behavior that you then think is conscious. It's important because this is one of the psychological tricks we play on ourselves, just because you're conscious of something. If you see um, a man walking next to a bear, you might think the man is conscious of the bear because you are, but it might not be. Okay, so uh, 
the thing about these two categories is we're trying to unify them. They're, they're very different. They're polar opposites. They have different derivations. In a way, this different derivation uh, characteristic is a lot like um, inertial versus gravitational mass. You have two kinds of mass, two ways of defining it, and yet they always seem to be the same. General relativity comes to the rescue, and once again, they fail to split the two. They seem the same. But they have two derivations. It's a triangulated. Again, another triangulation, a little bit uh, more abstract, not a good metaphor for this, but showing triangulation, you have a lot of derivations for the speed of light. It's the, it was the speed of electromagnetic waves and um, several other uh, derivations led to, to, to the right number and they were all the same and this this is like a convergence right so we're we, in will what, whether it's right or wrong we're gonna ask but when we categorize it out and we're looking at our own preconceived notions of these things we have these two categories and we want them to be the same we want to say that the conscious moment we observe is an example of will of that thing willing and conscious moments of myself is an example of me willing they're totally different they can't be mixed and matched. You can never have the other person's subjective experience. They never have a true, you can look in a mirror, but it's still not the same as just having a behavioral uh, experience of, of seeing a behavior, if it's your own behavior. And then various terms come on this, this arrow that goes from behavior to experience. Experience being something you could talk about. Uh, look, that person's experiencing walking by a bear, but you, you don't know. He might not have noticed so the experience that he was having was total obliviousness and which is not the same as experience walking by the bear now you can say no he did have this experience but he wasn't paying attention but the point is experience is rooted in your subjectivity behaviors were rooted in them you could talk about your own behavior but really you don't experience ever your own moments of awareness as behavior you don't see yourself from outside having them you see them subjectively all right, and we want to unify these things. So there's this connection between them and the gradation and all the terms that are related to uh, this kind of phenomena can go on this left to right gradation. You know, I have agency there. That's a behavioral statement about will. When you talk about agency, you're saying there's a behavioral uh, evidence of will. I could see behavior and associate that with will. I made a leap of faith perhaps be if, because really will is a subjective a phenomena over on the experience side and the subjective side and I put some other ones in there you know I put character up there I leaned that a little bit more towards how you behave though it is important what your experiences are and, and the feelings and, and the character of your experiences meaning your own thoughts are part of your experiences and uh, you know personal truth versus material fact I put intelligence a little more on the behavioral side love I put dead center